Five quick things today. Number one, let's look at this. We see Jesus here, and we see that his judgment is penetrating and glorious. As we look at verse 18, it says, And to the angel of the church of Thyatira, right? The words of the Son of God. That's the first time in this, in this section to these churches, and the only time that Jesus is named the Son of God. And this is it's only mentioned here, and it's, it's, uh, it's intended to speak to the authority that Jesus has to make this ruling, to make this judgment. It goes on. It says that he has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. This eyes that see everything. How many of you got that look from your dad? You were doing something and all of a sudden like your dad saw what you were doing. You didn't realize that he saw what you were doing, but you got the look. And there's all dads have the look I would say all moms have a look too, right moms? The look. You've caught them doing something. They might not know you've caught them doing something, but you are staring at them until they realize it's time to make eye contact and this is serious business. Jesus here is is described as having eyes like burning fire. And here's, here's the picture. It's the idea that he sees everything. We see later in the text, it talks about that he sees our motives. He sees our thoughts. He sees the motives of our heart. He knows what we do, and he knows why we do what we do. Now listen, you could do stuff, and I might never know. Some of us, you may do things, and your spouse may never find out this side of heaven. You may do things, and your parents may never find out. Listen, um, I tested that at at one point in high school, and my dad caught me the first two or three times that I did stuff that I wasn't supposed to be doing. And I just gave up because I was like, There's, how does he know? How does he know? He knew. He found out. But you might be able to hide things from your parents. You might be able to hide things from teachers. You might be able to hide things from whoever. But you will not hide what you do and why you do what you do from Christ. Eyes like burning fire. That goes on. Feet, uh, like uh, it talks about the bronze shoes here. Look here. And whose feet are like burnished bronze. Remember Thyatira, these bronze workers, they were known for this fancy, like glorious, it's just beautiful bronze. And Jesus is like, yeah, that, those are, that's what I wear on my feet. And the, is, is what's symbolic is that he, he walks around and he walks uprightly. He walks justly. He walks in glory. There's nowhere he can't walk. And he walks at times a little heavy footed because he's in control. He's in charge. This last week, um, uh, we were at the beach this last week, and we were there were some friends, and some friends who went to the beach before us sent us a text and said, hey, you need to hurry and get out here. There are dolphins, all right? I don't know about you, but when someone sees dolphins at the beach, like everything stops, and we're watching the fin just come up, right? We're thankful it's not a shark, and we think it's cool, right? And we're hoping there's going to somehow be just a flaming circle for them to jump through while we are out there. God, would you please make this happen in Jesus' name, right? Would you please, God, let them come in close to the beach. I'll grab on a fin and let me swim for just a second, and then they can bring me back. And I, that's what I want, Jesus, please, all right? There's something about us. We, we, we just, we love these majestic creatures, and they are. They're just beautiful. God's creation. Well, I'm still in the middle of kind of getting ready. The next thing I know, Julie is gone, Okay, Julia's gone, and where we stayed, there was just a little bit of walk. We were like one block, and we're kind of in a block off the beach. And so, um, so she's out. I later follow, and when I get there, she didn't get there in time to see the dolphins. We did see dolphins later, though, all right? Don't feel sorry for us. We were at the beach, okay? Um, <laughs> but she tells me this story. She said, yeah, I was walking on the road. I was walking down here, and there were some people in front of me, and apparently I was walking, like, with a purpose, and she's got these pink flip-flops on. You know how you sound when you walk with flip-flops anyway. But when you're walking quickly with purpose and you've got flip-flops on, especially thick pink ones apparently, um, whoever was in front of her was a decent ways in front and turned around and he said something like, I thought I heard some like heavy flip-flopping going on behind me, right? Right? She was coming with purpose. She, I was coming to see the dolphins. Well, listen, Jesus here it's like his feet are like bronze, and he's coming, and there's, there's nothing stopping him. He's getting everywhere. There's nowhere he's not going to be able to go. And this is speaking to his authority. It's speaking to how penetrating his eyes are and the glory of his steps where he walks. Okay, so we see Jesus as judge here like this in this church, and he, he tells them this, and this is important. Secondly, we see that Jesus is aware of their works. 
We see Jesus' awareness of their works. He knows what they're doing. Look at what it says in verse 19. I know your works. All right? Apparently, because he can see everything, and there's everywhere that he can go everywhere. There's nothing hidden from him. I know your works, and he gets specific about your works. It says your love and faith, service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed your first. So let's talk about this just for a second here. This, this love, the word here is agape. This is, this is God's love. This is, this is perfect love. This is not love for love's sake, right? Uh, a few years ago, uh, we were at Julie's uh, dad's uh, church for Christmas, and he talked about something that I just, has stuck with me. Have you, has someone ever gotten you a gift at Christmas, and you weren't planning on getting them a gift for Christmas? But because they got you something, now you have to get them something. Okay? Don't nod too hard. They may be nearby. Okay? He called it a gift for a gift gift. Right? It's a gift for a gift gift. It's like, I mean, I love you, but I wasn't going to get you anything. But since you got me something, I kind of feel obligated to get you something. This is not what Jesus is talking about right here. This is, this is just, uh, this is perfect love. This is God's love, unmerited favor, this agape love. And he says, look, I know you, you love me and you love people. You, you, you love with real love. Second thing he says is their faith. This faith is the assurance of what they believed without having yet seen it, but they believed it as if they had seen it. And they trusted God to the point where they acted out in faith. It says their service. You know, you know this, this Greek word. Um, it, it comes from the word diakonia. Uh, we get the word deacon, okay? Uh, what some people do with Scripture is anytime this word for service is used, they, they think, well, it's talking about deacons. Well, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, okay? Here, there's no reference to deacons in this church. It's talking about how they serve one another. Deacons is the idea that they are to serve tables, to serve in ways that... Um, that they're serving people in need, and they are serving expecting nothing in return from this person. And he's saying, you serve well. You serve with right heart motives. You're serving the right way. Um, so this is a good thing. And then he talks about their perseverance, that they're holding fast even when things are difficult. They're holding fast. And then fifth, it talks about their works that they increased. I, I love this. Look what it says in, again in the, at the end of verse 19. And that your latter works exceed the first. See, the Christian life is a growing life, not a coasting life. Let's say that again. The Christian life is a growing life, not a coasting life. Now listen, if you took someone's spiritual lifeline and charted where, how we grow, there, wouldn't there be lots of ups and downs in your life? Haven't there been times in your life that's like, wow, like amazing growth, and then other times it's like, oh, I'm really struggling. And then after that, but, but now I'm growing again. Oh, now I'm struggling again. There are lots of ups and downs, but the chart, we, we want the chart to just go like this straight, straight line up. But the truth is, it's a whole lot like this, isn't it? But the general trajectory of our life as we grow is going to be this direction. Although along that path, there are lots of ups and downs along the way, dips, Right? And this is saying here, Jesus is saying, you are growing in your works. You're growing in this. This is a good thing. What some of us do is we think, okay, I've done my part. Now it's time for me to coast. If you are a senior adult in this church, I want you to look at me right now. And if you don't know if you're a senior adult, just pretend you are for right now. Like, where's the line? Just, let's just pretend that, that that's you, Okay. You might retire from your profession, but you should never retire from your faith. Keep serving Christ. Some of, some of you, depending on where you kind of you are in life and, and what you're able to do physically, maybe you can't do some of the things you used to be able to do, or maybe you still can. But if you can't, you know one thing that you can do faithfully? You can pray my great-grandmother passed away, one of my great-grandparents. I have, I have a really solid heritage of great-grandparents. I have three great-grandparents that lived well into their 90s. Uh, my mom's grandmother on her mom's side, so my mom's mom's mom, she, I can't remember if she was half Cherokee Indian or a quarter Cherokee Indian. We called her Mother Robbie because my grandmother called her mother, and her husband called her Robbie because her first name was Robbie. And so all the grandchildren put that together, and it became Mother Robbie. I don't know, that was a weird, that was kind of weird how that happened, right? Mother Robbie was a prayer warrior. 
earlier in her life, until she physically couldn't do it, she, she was, her life was filled with good works because she loved Jesus. She lived in North Georgia on this little country area. There was a ball field, uh, a set of ball fields behind her house, and she would invite as many children from her area that would come, and she would do vacation Bible school in her driveway under the covered patio, kind of this area, every single year. She did that for about 40 years. She was a school teacher. She won local awards. She was teacher of the year multiple times uh, there in Fort Oglethorpe, the Ringgold area. She was a godly lady, but there came a time in her life that she could not physically do those things anymore. But can I tell you, she had a prayer list that was so long and she prayed for each one of those people in specific ways every single day, often multiple times a day. As, a, as her great-grandson, um, I've got a, actually, I've got a picture of her in, in my office um, with her great-great-grandson and me, my sister, and Julie. We, ha- we do have a five-generation picture at my grandmother's house uh, with all of us. It's an awesome thing. But can I tell you, every time I talk to her, every time, Eric, I'm praying for you, and this is what I'm praying. She was faithful. The Christian life, some of us, we think it's okay, we can coast, and some of us, um, regardless of where we are, we treat the Christian life like we're on cruise control. Yesterday, driving back from the beach, I was driving a friend's vehicle, and um, and she's got a newer car. Have you, have you seen these things, the cruise control and the newer cars that have the radar? And they only let you get so close to the car in front of you? I think some of us treat our, our Christian life like that. Some of us treat our Christian life like, okay, this is the speed God's calling me to go to, and this is where he's calling me to go. But the culture around me, I'm going to let the culture around me dictate how I go and where I go and how, the speed that I go. And if the, if the culture in front of me isn't moving to the speed that really God would, like, Lord, right, that we want to go, that God would have us go, you know what, I'm okay. I can set the cruise control to whatever, but um, if it's slower, I can, I'll just sit back here. I'll just sit back here, and we'll, we'll, we, will, we will cruise control our way around some of these things. But the truth is, that's not what this church was doing. They grew in their works, they, were, they grew in their faithfulness. They grew in their love for God. But something happened. Something happened. Number three, Jesus accuses them of being tolerant of false doctrine and then sin that corresponds to it. Jesus accuses, accuses them of being tolerant of false doctrine and corresponding sin. Let's look at this in verse number 20. Look at verse number 20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Okay, so this church was active in works. They were most likely very socially engaged in their city and their culture, but they became weak in the word. They became weak in the word. They tolerated false teaching and they've tolerated the false teacher. They saw it, and they knew it, but they did nothing about it. Look at what it says. It says in verse 20, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. They, they, they saw what was happening, and the leaders were weak and didn't speak up. The leaders were weak, and they didn't speak up. And this text calls her Jezebel. This is a, this is a lady who is teaching. This is possibly a fortune-telling woman that uh, had, had a, a conversion uh, experience, a possible conversion experience. But whoever it was, she was allowed to teach in the church because she had, well, she's real popular in the community. People know her. Let's let her teach. She's a good speaker. Let's just let her teach. But she hadn't been instructed in sound doctrine, and she spoke things that were out of bounds. She didn't teach the truth of God's Word. She taught contrary to what Jesus taught. Listen, if you think something, believe something, or teach something that's not what Jesus taught or spoke or believes, if it doesn't line up with Scripture, he's not the one that's wrong. Amen? He's not the one that's off. It's us. And he calls her 
Uh, Jesus calls her Jezebel. Now, this is, this is not her actual name, most likely. This is talking about her, her character, and we'll get to that in a minute. Look at what else it says. The woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. The elders didn't call her a prophetess. The church didn't call her a prophet. Well, this is, she's a prophetess of God. Like, no, she called herself that. And no one corrected her. She called herself that, and no one corrected her. This is the idea. She comes in. I know what God, you know what God's, God's, God wants me to tell you something. He has spoken to me, and I'm supposed to tell you. Now, sometimes that could happen. Right? That's, it's possible but we need to be really careful how we listen and receive that. Because guess what? If you know Jesus, you got a phone too. He can call you. Can he? So we need, just because someone says, God spoke to me about this in your life, maybe. But we really need to make sure that we weigh that in Scripture. And we, say, we take that to the Lord ourselves. We've got to be discerning with this. Okay? So she calls herself a, prophet, a prophetess. The elders didn't call her that. And... And then it says, and she is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. This is why Jesus calls her Jezebel, okay? Uh, Jezebel was an Old Testament queen. She was married to King Ahab, and she was a sinful, evil woman, okay? Um, so the Old Testament Jezebel married to King Ahab. She mixed worship to false pagan gods with the true worship of God. Now listen, if the people of Israel had just heard, hey, let's throw away everything here that we know is good and right and true, and let's just do this instead, they would have kind of bucked against that. So what she did was, well, I mean, let's take everything that we have, but let's just put this pagan false worship stuff, let's mix it up and let's put it in there with it. And her husband was weak. It could, have, it could have very easily, she could have been tempted in that way and tried to do that, and he could have just said, um, no, we're not doing that. That's not what God would have us do. We're not doing that. We're not going there. But he didn't. Essentially, he just kind of yes-deered his way through whatever she wanted because he was afraid of her. Men, we are to spiritually lead. Ladies, you are to spiritually come alongside of us and us do this together, but the men, we're called to lead. Men, some of your wives struggle letting you lead because if you were going down 400 and you were, and you were in the passenger seat and someone was driving you, and as they're going 80 miles an hour because none of us drive the speed limit on 400, if they just, in the middle of just driving down the road, let go of the steering wheel and climbed into the back seat, gentlemen, would you ever let that person drive you anywhere again? No, you would not. If you did, you'd be crazy to let someone who would, while they're going 80, climb in the back seat and just like, I hope we don't crash and die. Some of us men, our wives struggle not taking over. They struggle letting us lead, because at some point we have abdicated the driver's seat. And they're scared. Can, can they really trust us? Ladies, I'm asking you to risk it. Men, don't make them pay for risking it. Ahab is a weak man. He's a weak leader, and he yes dears his way through um, aligning himself against God. That's basically what happens. Some of the moral practices here of the, of the actual Jezebel were sexual in, in nature, and it was against God's design. And now this new lady who is in this church in Thyatira, she's teaching things that also are against God's design, and some of the ways that this is happening is in that same fashion, in that same fashion. This Thyatira Jezebel likely taught this. Okay, we have all these guilds, and if you're going to work in this area, you've got to go to this worship service, to this false god, this feast, this evil, like nasty, like perverse thing, and it's worship to this false god. But you know, our one true God, he wouldn't want you to lose your job, so you probably should just go ahead and be a part of that. Go be light there as you're participating in the same things they're doing. In a lot of ways, that's what she was teaching. 
And Jesus says, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh. God, she would say things like, well, we can't lose our jobs. Who will tell them about Jesus if we get fired for for not participating in these practices? God wouldn't want you to be poor. He wouldn't want you to suffer. It's no big deal to participate in these things. In the common day, you know, we do some similar things sometimes. At the very least, we will stay silent because we don't want to, we're afraid of losing our job. Well, you know, I work in a place that I, I'm not allowed to tell people about Jesus. Well, one day we're going to see Jesus face to face. What's he going to think about your um, or my adherence to man's rules if they come into conflict with his rules? Now, should you be a jerk at work and, like, just, like, hit people with Jesus? No. You speak the truth in love. But do you love Jesus or do you love your paycheck? We just studied two sessions ago on this about a church that was poor. And of the four churches we've read about, Jesus had nothing bad to say about them. And why were they poor? Because they all lost their jobs for standing for truth. I'm not saying go tomorrow. Your job tomorrow, if you're going to follow Jesus, is get fired. That's not, my, that's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you don't back down from sharing the gospel with people who are spiritually dead and, and they're going to hell because you're afraid of you might get in trouble at work. That's what I'm telling you. I think you can be smart enough crafty enough and creative enough that you can love people in Jesus' name and speak the truth and love to them in, a, in most places in a way that won't get you fired, especially when they see maybe you're the best employee they have because you're a Christ follower and you're working as unto the Lord. Thank you. Like one of you. Awesome. We've got to be discerning. This false teacher and this false teaching was in this church, and they tolerated it. They weren't discerning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 tells us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. One pastor I listened to a couple weeks ago on this same text, he said if in the early church, this is, this is 1 John, if in the early church many false prophets had gone out into the world, I wonder how many there are today. Amen. Jesus also said this in Matthew 7, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We've got to be careful. Just because someone says they're representing the one true God doesn't necessarily mean that they are. We've got to be careful. Watch out. Listen, watch out for the people who teach, well, let's just feel good. Watch out for the feel-good teachers, and they smile, and they've got the big pearly white teeth the whole time, and they never talk about sin. They never talk about right or wrong. They just talk about how to be the best version of you. Listen, the best version of Eric Dill will go straight to hell. Okay? Don't listen to those people. They can draw a crowd, but they don't know Jesus. Watch out for those who have a Bible and their other book that they also claim is from God. Watch out for those who teach falsely about Christ. Watch out for the prosperity teachers. Watch out for those who call evil good and call good evil. Well, how do you know what to look for? How do you know what to look for? How can you spot a false teacher? How can you spot false teaching? Here's the most most simple way, and then I'll I'll give you some specific things. The most simple way. How do you know a lie when you hear it? Well, you know... You know a lie when you hear it if you know the truth really well. You know a lie when you hear it when you know the truth really well. You become an expert in recognizing the counterfeit by knowing the genuine expertly. So let me give you three tests. Three tests for spotting false teachers. Here's the first test. Character test. Three tests for spotting false teachers. The first first test is the character test. The fruit of their life. Jesus, uh, the scripture talks about in Galatians, the fruit of the spirit, love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law, right? The fruit of the Spirit. The first test is, do they live a godly life, and is there fruit coming out of their life? Second test, 
Okay, is it a false teacher? Maybe they pass the character test. If they pass the character test, we move to the next part of the filter, the test of content. So the first test is how do they live? The second test is what do they teach? What do they teach? Especially about the identity and work of Jesus Christ. Okay? There are, there are groups of people who call themselves Christians, but they say Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. They come around your neighborhood riding bicycles, and they have a little name tag. And they believe Jesus and Satan were brothers, and that they are created beings, that Jesus is a created being. Jesus is the eternal, part of the eternal Godhead. You celebrate Christmas because that's when we celebrate his earthly coming, the Advent. But in Genesis 1, it, it, it uses and, and let us make man in our own image. Plural pronouns. Jesus, the Father, the Spirit are all there at creation, and they have always been. Okay? What do they say about Jesus' identity? And what do they teach about the work of Christ? Meaning, how does someone go from being lost to being, a follow, to being saved? Listen. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If they take anything away from that and say, well, uh, yeah, but not this. Or if they add anything to that, yeah, that, but you also have to be baptized or you can't be a Christian. Okay? Those are cults. Those are cults. That is not what Jesus taught. That is not what Jesus taught. So we have the test of character, the test of content, one pastor said the, called the third test, I stole a C from him, the test of their converts. The test of their converts. Meaning, the people who follow them, what are they like? Can I tell you, there are lots of children's ministries and student ministries, and because of what I'm about to say, there are now lots of churches, especially in the United States of America, that are very entertainment-driven. Let's entertain so we can get as big a crowd as possible in this place, and that's how we'll know we're doing good. When they're here, we'll, we'll give them a, a little Jesus light. When they're here, we'll give them a little Jesus light, and then we'll, we'll all feel good about that. The reason I believe when we now have all these churches that are very entertainment-driven we have all these people for multiple generations. We've used student ministry and children's ministry. We've got to keep the kids happy because the parents, they're giving their tithe. We've got to keep their students happy. We gotta let, they want to like the church because their parents are tithing. So we gotta, if the kids and, and students aren't happy, they'll leave and they'll take their money with them. That's how a lot of people, a lot of churches think. And I'm here to tell you, let's look at what, what comes of all this. After a few years serving where I, where I once served, I started looking at my students, and they're getting to college, and they don't know what they, they're not grounding their faith, they're, they're flaking, they're, they're doing all this stuff, and I thought, this is not working. Why are we doing this this way? Why, look at what we're producing. What we're producing is not good. We had a bunch of people here on Wednesday night, but they're living the rest of the week like they've never heard of Jesus. What is going on? And so we adjusted. And what we began to see is more fruit, more faithfulness. We start looking at their converts. So we can see here the truth, all right? Look at, look at their character, their content, and then look at their converts. Let's finish up here. Number four, we see this. We see Jesus' patient judgment and gracious discipline. Look at verse number 21. It says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses, I gave her time to repent, she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Jesus is not just like, all right, gotcha. Jesus is not in heaven on the edge of his seat looking for you to mess up so he can zap you. He's not. This lady was like, she was out there with stuff she was teaching and saying was good even though it wasn't. And what did Jesus do? He was patient. He was trying to give her time to repent when he saw that she, and he knew, but he gave her ample time. And when he, saw, when, he, when he got to the point where it was evident she was not going to repent, then he says what he says next. Look at verse 22. 
Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tri- tribulation. Not the great tribulation, it's just the idea of great suffering, okay? Unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give each of you, to each of you according to his works. You know what basically he says? All right, you want the sexual immorality? I'll give you the results of that. There are things that are results of sexual immorality that, that we as a culture have today. They're around today that some things there are a cure for, some things there are not a cure for. Some of those things were very prevalent in Thyatira and in that world back then. And Jesus said, you know what? You want it? This is what comes with it. I'll just let you have it. Some of you won't live through it. Some of you, your children are going to die because of it. This is really what you want. This is what comes with it. He tried not to give that to her and to them. But they kept choosing and kept choosing and kept choosing. He's patient. He was gracious. But if you're his, he will discipline you. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you and he's a good dad. Good parents discipline and correct. Bad parents let you do whatever you want and don't give you rules. Okay? That's not, an op- that's not a badge to over correct parents. We know Ephesians 6 talks to us, especially dads. Don't, don't, we don't beat them down so much that they, like, rebel. But we've got to correct. We've got to discipline. If, at a certain point, if we let them behave a certain way, it becomes our fault. So we see his patient judgment. Look at verse 25. Or verse 24 and then verse 25. But to the rest of you at Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. Let's look at number five. Look at number five. Number five, Jesus, we see his promises for the future. Look at verse 26 through 29. The one who conquers and who keeps my words until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. This is a reference to Psalm chapter 2, um, there's a song, Ask and I'll Give the Nations to You, right? It's, it's a reference back to this, and it, and it also becomes a reference to the coming millennium uh, that I believe is, is coming of the thousand-year reign. It talks about the one who conquers, who keeps words and t- my words until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, So he's saying he's going to give people who are faithful authority to rule in the future. Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. We'll come back to that. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Morning star. Before this, it talks about the deeper things of Satan. Often in churches, what happens is people, just give me the deeper things. I just want the deeper things of God. I want to know, like, all, and, and that's good. I'm not saying that's bad. But sometimes the deeper things might not necessarily be the things of God, <laughs> like the deeper teaching. Let's get into this, this, this mysticism. Let's get into some of these extra biblical things. Let's get into some of all this stuff. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold fast to what you have and focus on what the real prize is. In verse 28, Jesus is telling the church, look, Remember what the real prize is. Church family, heaven is going to be awesome. Right? Heaven is going to be awesome. But the only thing that makes heaven heaven is that Jesus is there. A morning star, he's saying, like, you, you, want, you want all these things from me, but you need to remember that Jesus is speaking. He's saying, I'm the prize that you're looking for. Jesus is the only one that's going to satisfy us. Jesus is the only one who's going to, to uh, help us endure. He's the only one who's going to lead us. He is our prize. Not just God's blood. Listen, are we grateful that God has blessed our nation? Lord, yeah. Yes. Lord, yeah. But do we worship our nation? Do we worship the blessings that we are given from God? If we do, 
we are guilty of idolatry. We worship Jesus. Verse 28, and I will give them the morning star, like the real bride. So a couple of questions for us today. Three questions. First question, number one, would you be able to spot false teaching false teaching or false teachers? Do you know the truth of God's word enough that you would be able to spot false teaching? Second question, are you holding fast to what God has given you, your identity in Christ, or are you living below that because you're on cruise control? Third question, what do you really desire from God? What do I really desire from God? If the answer is anything other than, I just want to know Jesus, our priorities are out of line. Now, we know Jesus through his word. He reveals himself to us through creation, and these are good things of and from God. But if I want things from God without actually wanting God, I am missing it. I'm missing it. You want the deep things? Here are the deep things. Love and worship Jesus. Be satisfied in him. One pastor says it like this. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I like that. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. When that plays out, when I'm fully satisfied with Jesus, I'm not looking for other stuff to satisfy me. I'm pursuing him. I'm loving him. I'm seeking his face, not just his hand. Church family, for you today, for us today, let's be a church that's growing in our works. Yes, that's growing in our faith. The works we're doing now are greater even than what we did before. Not resting on, remember those good old days. But let's also be a church that stands on the truth, unwavering from God's word, especially when it is contrary to our culture, because he is our prize. Let's pray.